now continue with reading the Bible. And we're going to read from Jonah chapter 3, verse 10 to the end of the chapter. Uh, this is the last chapter of Jonah, and as Nalini comes up, I'll just give you a brief synopsis of what's happened. Remember, God called Jonah to go to proclaim to God's people, and uh, Jonah went in the opposite direction. God sent a storm. Jonah got swallowed by a fish. Jonah realized that he needed to obey God. He went into the great city of Nineveh, he said, proclaim God's word, and uh, People believed in the Lord, and this is after people had uh, turned to God again. Jonah then has this encounter with the Lord. So we're reading from Jonah verse, uh, chapter 3, verse 10, to the end of chapter 4. When God saw what they did and how they turned from their evil ways, he relented and did not bring on them the destruction he had threatened. But to Jonah, this seemed very wrong, and he became angry. He prayed to the Lord, Isn't this what I said, Lord, when I was still at home? That is what I tried to forestall in fleeing to Tarshish. I knew that you were a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamity, but now, Lord, take away my life, for it is better for me to die than to live. But the Lord replied, Is it right for you to be angry? Jonah had gone out and sat down in a place east of the city. There he made himself a shelter, sat in its shade, and waited to see what would happen to the city. Then the Lord God provided a leafy plant and made it grow up over Jonah to give shade for his head to ease his discomfort. And Jonah was very happy about the plant. But as dawn the next day, God provided a worm which chewed the plant so that it withered. When the sun rose, God provided a scorching east wind and the sun blazed on Jonah's head so that he grew faint. He wanted to die and said, it would, better, it would be better for me to die than to live. But God said to Jonah, is it right for you to be angry about the plant? It is, he said, and I'm so angry I wish I were dead. But the Lord said, you have been concerned about this plant, though you did not tend it or make it grow. It sprang up overnight and died overnight. And should I not be, have concern for the great city of Nineveh in which there are more than 120,000 people who cannot tell their right hand from their left, and also many animals. Uh, as Phil comes up to preach, I'll pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for your love and your mercy and your grace to us. Uh, we especially thank you that we could meet today uh, to reflect on your word to us. We thank you that you speak to us by your word. Thank you for providing your servant to speak to us. Thank you uh, for the words he's, uh, you've given him. Uh, thank you for being here by your spirit. And we ask now that as we turn our hearts to you, that you would uh, give us open hearts, that you give us sensitive consciences to the work of your spirit. Help us become more like the Lord Jesus Christ. We ask this in his name. Amen. Well, it's good to be uh, with you again today as we look at the uh, last chapter of Jonah. Now, I wonder if you've ever driven in a car which has been out of tune. Usually the car runs rough. Might be hard to start. Once it's started, it doesn't run smoothly, but it jolts and vibrates. <laughs> 
the engine splutters, smoke my billow out from the exhaust, and eventually, if the car isn't serviced, might break down completely, or you might, might finish up in an accident. I know that's happened to us. I uh, had an old car that always seemed to be breaking down and broken down in the middle of Gosford. And uh, it can be very embarrassing when you hold up traffic for about a kilometre. Well, you know, our relationship with, with God can become like a car out of tune. If God's priorities aren't reflected in your life, then your relationship with him deteriorates and eventually breaks down. And in the book of Jonah, we've got a case study of a man whose life got out of tune with God. He was a prophet of God who had difficulties reflecting God's priorities in his thinking and behaviour. Today I want us to see from Jonah's life some of the reasons why our lives may reflect, uh, fail to reflect God's priorities. One way we can get out of tune with God is to have a wrong understanding of his character and also the way God works in the world. This is clear from Jonah's attitude towards God, which you find in chapter 4. And the Ninevites repented at the preaching of Jonah and they were spared. You would have thought that Jonah would be overjoyed. But no, we read in verse 1 that Jonah was greatly displeased and became angry. Jonah took no pleasure whatsoever in the great work of grace that God had done in Nineveh. The more he thought about it, the more he brooded and pouted, till eventually he developed a deep resentment against the Lord. So what was Jonah's problem? Well, his problem, as outlined in verses 1 to 3, was that he could not come to terms with the fact that God would show grace and mercy to a heathen nation. Look at Jonah's prayer. <clears throat> Jonah's anger at God's compassion towards the Ninevites is evident in verse 2, where he says, O oh Lord, is this not what I said when I was still at home? This is why I was so quick to flee to Tarshish. I knew that you were a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love. God who relents from sending calamity. Jonah's prayer shows his warped preconceptions of God. The fact that Jonah correctly perceived the generosity of God's love and then he objected to that is a chilling reminder of how unloving and spiritually blind we can become when we have a warped view of God. Yes, Jonah could accept God's mercy in his own life. That's clear from his words in chapter 2 that Glenn reflected on this morning. But he couldn't accept that God would forgive those who were not part of God's chosen people, such as the Ninevites. Jonah's agenda was to see the Ninevites destroyed. And now he isn't mad at God sparing them. Well, just as Jonah got mad because he had a preconceived view of God, so we can get angry or discouraged when we have a wrong view of God. Some people are crippled in their relationship with God because they don't think God will forgive them or they can't forgive themselves. Some reject God because they can't understand why he would allow themselves or their loved ones to suffer. Some think that God doesn't exist because he doesn't appear to answer their prayers. Some think that God is like Santa Claus, only rewarding them if they live good lives. Some see God as a judge. They feel discouraged because they feel that they can't, can't shape up to his standards. I wonder if you can identify with any of these ways of viewing God. 
Perhaps there are areas there that you struggle with. Because they're all warped views of God. Because they're either wrong or they provide a distorted view of his character. So how then can we ensure that we have a correct understanding of God, his character, the way he works in the world? Well, it's from the words of scripture, a scripture that reveals the character of God. It's God's word that helps guard us against developing warped preconceptions of God, as Jonah had. It's God's word that helps us to properly understand his salvation through the Lord Jesus Christ. It's God's word that helps us grasp how the Holy Spirit works in our lives and in the works of the lives of others to make us more like our Lord Jesus Christ. And so one reason why we may be unable to understand God's priorities in our lives and in the world is because we have a warped preconception of God. You also may be unable to understand God's priorities because of a wrong attitude of heart. And in the case of Jonah, <clears throat> he lost sight of God's priorities for the world because his heart was full of pride. He lost sight that the fact that both he and the Ninevites were united spiritually with each other because they'd both been saved through God's mercy. And when spiritual pride takes hold of your thinking, it's easy to regard yourself <clears throat> as one of God's exclusive people. When we look at Christians in other denominations, so often negative thoughts come to mind. We criticise their form of worship, their preaching, their understanding of doctrine, even the type of people who attend the services. And if we see churches that are growing, we're apt to be cynical. We're tempted to find faults with what they're doing, whether it be in the form of evangelism used or their philosophy of ministry. And even in, and in our own denomination, <clears throat> churches that are innovative in evangelism and in ministry can be the uh, subject of criticism and rivalry. Well, certainly where there's serious doctrinal error, there's reason to be concerned, especially in regard to those involved in the cults. But so often, the root of the problem is spiritual pride feeling that we're the only true church, we're the only ones who are doctrinally sound, and that can be a real problem in, our, in the Presbyterian church. And so just as God challenged Jonah's right to be angry, God challenges us to examine the motivation that underlies our desire to criticise others. <clears throat> Once we think that we are God's exclusive people, think that wisdom will die with us becomes the easiest thing in the world to write off other people and other viewpoints even though they may trust in Christ for their salvation. <clears throat> we need to realise that God is consistent in his attitudes and where there's humbling of hearts God shows saving grace even to those who think very differently to us. And so God wants you and I to, that like Jonah, <clears throat> the pride and the prejudice in our hearts can be a real stumbling block to the advancement of the gospel in the world. If the Apostle Paul could rejoice when Christ was preached, whether from false motives or true, then we should also rejoice when we see Christ preached today and we see lives changed by his grace. <clears throat> yes, pride can also become a stumbling block in our relationship with God himself. And as you can see from Jonah's prayer in verses 2 and 3, it was characterised 
by self-centeredness and arrogance. He lectured God about what he thought was wrong with the situation. He was convinced in his mind that God's goodness should be shown only to the Israelites and not to Gentiles. <clears throat> but the amazing thing was, was the Lord's response to Jonah was not harsh or judgmental. God listened to Jonah's prayer, but he didn't grant Jonah's request. You cannot expect God to answer your prayers when you pray prayers that are self-centred or arrogant or where you're not willing to submit to God's priorities wherever he leads. As James says in his letter, when you ask, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives. And so the Lord's response is to gently but firmly challenge Jonah. He says to Jonah, have you any right to be angry? The Lord challenged Jonah to think carefully about his motivations, to help him see that his motivations were totally unjustified. That's why it's so important for us to read God's word, even before we pray, so we can be sure that our motivations in prayer are as pure as possible, that we totally desire to pray accordingly, accordingly to God's will. It's then we'll see God working in our lives. So Jonah was unable to accept God's priorities in his thinking because he had a warped conception of God and also he had a proud heart. But Jonah also became angry with God because he trusted in God's gifts rather than in God himself, which is a form of idolatry. And as we see in verse 4 of chapter 4, the Lord challenged Jonah's angry heart. But God, Jonah was still not prepared to listen. We're told that Jonah sat down outside the city and waited to see what would happen to it. Jonah was still determined to see these Ninevites destroyed. <clears throat> While every passing minute added to the proof that God had spared them, Jonah's heart got harder and harder. But God was still gracious to Jonah. Even in the face of Jonah's anger, the Lord poured out his love. And we read in verse 6, The Lord God provided a vine, made it grow up over Jonah, to give shade for his head, to ease his discomfort. Jonah was very happy about the vine. And so while God showed his care for Jonah, he wasn't about to be overcome by Jonah's evil. God also wanted to teach Jonah something of the meaning of free grace and the need for a change in heart. And so the real test was, came when the vine was taken away. The vine was a free gift, but Jonah acted as if God owed him the vine. And that was proof that he did not receive it as a gift of God's grace. And when Jonah's vine vanished, he should have learned from this that God was a God of all grace. The grace is his free gift, given where it is undeserved. And that should have brought home to him that the grace that was given to the Israelites is the same grace that God showed to Nineveh. I think like Jonah, we can fall into the same temptation to worship his gifts rather than worship God himself. Just as a vine withered, God's gifts to us can be taken away, whether it be health, love of a marriage partner, career prospects, financial security. And the test is, if these things are taken away from us, do we blame God like Jonah did? Do we th see these things as a gift of God, which are given to us by his grace, for which we should be thankful? Well, the other lesson that God taught Jonah 
was that we not only should be thankful for God's grace in his own life, but you should be thankful for God's love to the lost. God pointed out to Jonah in the same way that Jonah would have spared the vine because it brought comfort to him. So God spared Nineveh because of his great love for the lost. In fact, God says in verse 11, But Nineveh has more than 120,000 people who cannot tell their right hand from their left, and many cattle as well. Should I not be concerned about that great city? We don't know how Jonah responded to what God said here. but In many ways it doesn't matter. The most important thing is learning about God's gracious purpose to save people. God cared about Jonah and Jonah as a believer was safe in the everlasting arms of the Lord. But Jonah also had to learn that God wanted him to be concerned about those who were perishing around him. In the same way, God calls you and I to share his priorities for the world. That includes showing concern for those around us or sharing them, sharing with them the good news of the gospel when we have the right opportunity, sharing the gospel in both word and deed. Yes, it's easy to talk about our concern for non-believers. To say that we believe Christ to be the answer to their deepest spiritual and temporal needs and yet be quite cold and detached, lacking in motivation when it comes to telling others about the good news of the gospel. It's easy to make up all kinds of excuses why we don't evangelise others whether because we're too busy, afraid to offend our neighbours, think it's a job for the experts, don't feel that we have the gift to speak to others. Because of his grace, God wants us to have a burning love for other people. He wants us to have a real concern for them, just as God was concerned about the people of Nineveh. He wants us to be concerned about their eternal destiny to desire with all our hearts to introduce them to the Lord Jesus Christ. God was concerned for the lost. He wanted to bring them to salvation. And that's still one of God's key priorities in the world. That's why he challenged Jonah's conception of God, his motivations, the basis of his faith. And today this truth great truth still stands. Just as God showed mercy on the Ninevites by delivering them through the preaching of Jonah, so God's consistent in the way he shows grace and mercy to us. Yes, like the Ninevites, we sin and we turn our back on God. We too deserve God's wrath and condemnation because God so loved us. He sent his son Jesus into the world so that he might deliver us from the bondage of sin and death. And it's this great message of the gospel that God has commissioned us to take to others. Just as you were privileged to hear and respond to the gospel yourself. Do you love your family members or the people living in the place where you live? Are you spiritually concerned for those people who are present in situations where God has placed you? Do you pray for their salvation or their growth in their relationship with the Lord? Do you pray for those who are sent out from this church and other churches to make God's word known in overseas countries? God's concern for his people and for those who are spiritually lost as seen through the book of Jonah should spur us on in the task that God has given us because God wants you to adopt his priorities to go and make disciples of all nations teach others how they can serve Christ as their Saviour and Lord.
Amen. Let's pray. Well, we thank you for the lessons that we learn from the book of Jonah. Lord, so often our priorities in life are wrong. Lord, so often we have wrong ideas about you because we're influenced so much by the values of this world. So often we're tempted to trust in things other than you that we know is idolatry rather than putting you at the centre of our life. Lord, so often we have wrong priorities in our life. Well, we pray that through your Holy Spirit you would convict us of our sin, help us to, renew, to realise anew what Jesus has done for us in dying for our sin on the cross, the wonderful grace is showed in our life, in the life of many around us. Help us to be grateful for what our Lord has done for us. We pray that we might show, reflect that gratitude in the way we lead our lives, in the way we care for others, in the way we use opportunities that you give us to make the good news of the gospel known to those who have no hope or are perishing. And so we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's continue in prayer. Lord, we thank you for speaking to us today. Uh, we ask again that you would forgive us for having proud and selfish hearts, hearts that are only concerned about our personal priorities, hearts that are only concerned about our private uh, spirituality. We ask that you would empower us and align our, in our affections, that we will be witnesses of your gospel to the dying world around us. We ask that you would forgive us again for only engaging with the world when our freedoms are under threat. Uh, we ask you to forgive us for only engaging uh, with the world and speaking to the world uh, to point out this. And you know, Father, that uh, most of our conversations about the world is about how sinful they are and how they reject you. We ask you that we would be people that truly understand the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ deep in our hearts. Give us hearts that are aligned with yours, hearts that are soft and tender, hearts that are merciful, uh, hearts that are joined to the Lord Jesus Christ. Help us engage uh, with our family, with our friends and our community to then share the mercy and grace and hope that is found in the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, as the year winds up, uh, we pray for those who are uncertain about the year ahead, uh, whether it's concern about work or school or university or life situation. You know, Lord, that uh, we all have doubts. And so we ask that you'd please be with all your people Help us all have the confidence uh, that you will care for us because you are kind and gracious. Uh, help us make our priorities your priority. Father, we ask that you would move among all your people, uh, move by your spirit uh, and by your word. Uh, please help us uh, align our priorities with yours. Uh, Father, as the country celebrates Australia Day this coming week, we ask that you would make us people of peace and reconciliation. We ask that as believers, we will be salt and light in this dying world around us. Help us be known for our love for you. Uh, help us not simply be known for uh, whatever political ideology we have of you. Uh, we ask that the gospel may shape all aspects of our lives. Father, we don't want to be people that only speak of your personal salvation to us, uh, yet reject you. Uh, 
as Lord in all areas of our lives. And so we ask that you'd please uh, help us submit to you. Uh, we bring our personal lives to you. We bring our church to you. We bring our community to you and bring our nation to you. Please be with us in the year ahead. And we pray all these things in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.